Well, thank you all. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce you, introduce our speaker for the Tufts Healthy Aging at Tufts uh, uh, webinar series for the spring. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. James Kirkland, who's the director of the Robert and Arlene Kogod Center on Aging at Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. Uh, Jim is also the Nober Foundation Professor of Aging Research. He's been a real leader in the area of cellular senescence and the development of senolytic therapies uh, to treat cellular senescence. And the title of his talk today is Aging, Cellular Senescence, and Senolytic Drugs, The Path to Translation. So welcome, Jim, and I'll turn it over to you. Thanks so much for joining us. Thanks very much, uh, Roger, and thanks, everybody. Um, we'll see if my screen comes up. So is that coming up all right? Okay. So I'm going to speak about, as, as Roger mentioned, I'm going to speak about aging, cellular senescence, and senolytic drugs, and where we're at in the pathway towards trying to bring these things to people. Um, so by way of disclosure, um, Mayo Clinic and our laboratory hold some uh, patents and we're formally related to a company. Uh, I'm not uh, related to that company uh, currently, but Mayo Clinic does hold uh, patents. So what I'm going to speak about um, relies on the Gerasine hypothesis that was first proposed by Gordon Lithgow about 20 years ago and uh, then received a lot of attention through Felipe Sierra, who is former director of the Division of Aging Biology at the um, NIH. And that's the, the Gerasine hypothesis holds that fundamental aging processes may be root cause contributors to changes that occur with aging, like uh, uh, phenotypes in older individuals, but also the geriatric syndromes, things like sarcopenia, frailty, immobility, malcognitive impairment, multiple chronic diseases, and decreased physical resilience, that is decreased capacity to uh, recover after an infection or after surgery or to withstand chemotherapy. So people have divided fundamental aging processes up into groups anywhere from four to 13 plus. I think very simply, so I like to think of four groups of fundamental aging processes, and I note that they're most likely very highly interlinked, what we call the unitary theory of fundamental aging mechanisms. So amongst these processes are processes involving chronic low-grade sterile, that is in the absence of bacteria and fungi that are known, uh, inflammation that tends to be associated with fibrosis, uh, macromolecular and organelle dysfunction, um, including things that you're all aware of, uh, things uh, related to epigenetic changes in DNA, single strand breaks, even DNA rearrangements, um, and other changes in nucleotides. Uh, protein uh, changes, including formation of aggregates, misfolded proteins, failed autophagy, problems with sugars, especially reducing sugars involving uh, the Maillard reaction to form, say, advanced glycation end products. Problems with lipids, especially saturated lipids like uh, saturated fatty acids, ceramides, bradykines, um, and lipotoxicity. And then issues with a number of intracellular organelles, especially mitochondria, but also uh, multiple other uh, organelles. The third basket of fundamental aging processes include stem and progenitor cell uh, dysfunction, uh, typically with uh, decreased or altered proliferative capacity of uh, stem and progenitor cells and disdifferentiation of these cell types increasing with increasing age. And then finally, cellular senescence, which I'm going to focus on. So these fundamental aging pro mechanisms, as I mentioned, are tightly interlinked. It looks like if you intervene in one of them, you tend to affect many or perhaps even all of the rest. And I'd emphasize that a lot of chronic diseases, the major chronic diseases, tend to be associated with these uh, fundamental aging processes occurring at any point during life. So these mechanisms start acting at the time of conception on. And there are many chronic diseases, even in children and younger adults, that appear to be related to these uh, kinds of processes that drive uh, fundamental aging mechanisms. Um, the contribution to chronic diseases is pronounced. For example, around 80% of the risk of Alzheimer's disease can be predicted from chronological age alone. The risk of having a heart attack or stroke is increased two to fourfold by having a high blood sugar, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, family history, 
but if you're 85 as opposed to 30, your relative risk is increased hundreds of fold. So these conditions seem to be root cause contributors to the major conditions that account for the bulk of morbidity, mortality, and health expenditures. So cellular senescence was described first by Hayflick and, or published first by Hayflick and Moorhead back in 1961. Before that, people thought that cells could divide indefinitely. Uh, a guy called Carroll did experiments, for example, with chicken heart cells, where he um, repeatedly cultured these cells and found no replicative limit to them. But unfortunately, in the 1930s, when they did cell culture and were using serum to grow the cells, that serum contained cells. So whenever they were splitting cells, they were adding new cells. So for a long time, it was felt that aging processes were driven by things like the thymus or endocrine changes, et cetera, because it was felt that cells were immortal and did not uh, undergo inherent changes with increasing age. Hayflick and Moore had changed that whole landscape dramatically with their 1961 paper, showing that um, uh, human cells have a limited replicative potential whereupon uh, they start losing replicative potential, and then they eventually um, have no replicative potential, these cells, and they either die or they go into a state of cellular senescence. Senescent cells um, are very metabolically active, generally. They tend to be three times larger than normal cells. They produce a lot of protein. They're resistant to dying, in fact, uh, and they have essentially irreversible loss of replicative potential. They exhibit a lot of DNA damage foci and um, um, they, they change considerably over time. So senescence is a cell fate, like replication, differentiation, apoptosis, or necrosis. And there are some 40 or 50 things which can tend to push a cell towards the senescent cell fate. The combination of these things can make a cell actually become senescent as opposed to entering other cell fates. Uh, and th the kinds of factors that can induce a cell to become senescent are mainly damage-related sort of signals. So DNA damage can induce the cell to become senescent, uh, expression of oncogenes, um, reactive damaging metabolites can do it, repeated replication, as I mentioned, will do it, as well as mitogens. Uh, proteotoxic stress, even the presence of protein aggregates, for example, can make cells become senescent. Mechanical stress and shear stress can make a cell become senescent. So this is how senescent cells appear in the knee joint in osteoarthritis or in AV fistulae on the venous side because of shear stress. Hypoxic and hyperoxic stress can do it. Uh, damage uh, associated molecular pattern proteins, that is external signals like external DNA um, that shouldn't be outside a cell can induce a cell to become senescent. And there, then various pathogen-related uh, signals can make a cell become senescent. This is particularly relevant with respect to coronaviruses I'll talk about in a moment. And then there are a variety of drugs that can make cells become senescent, particularly alkylating agents, anthracyclines, and then treatments like radiation. So there are any one of three, four, or five transcription factor cascades that can become activated. Uh, that enforce the senescent cell fate, it takes anywhere from 10 days to six weeks for a cell to become fully senescent. So it's much slower than the other cell fates like replication or differentiation to occur. 10 days to six weeks. This is important when it comes to scheduling dosing of drugs that clear senescent cells, as I'll talk about in a moment. The transcription factor cascades um, uh, are not necessarily all activated within senescent cells. Not every senescent cell has high P16, for example. It's not a totally sensitive and specific marker for senescent cells. The same with P21 or P27 or some of the other pathways. Some senescent cells, 30 to 70%, but not all, can acquire a senescence-associated secretory phenotype. And there are at least a couple of interacting pathways through which this can occur. The senescence-associated secretory phenotype in these 30 to 70% of senescent cells that we call deleterious senescent cells uh, can um, uh, express involves production of multiple proteins, peptides, bioactive lipids, uh, non-coding nucleotides, uh, exosomes, microsomes, all kinds of other things that get produced. Uh, the um, net effect of the secretory phenotype can be, in the wrong circumstances, tissue destruction and dysfunction. Because uh, amongst the things that are produced are many inflammatory cytokines, uh, 
chemokines that attract, activate, and anchor immune cells, proteases that break down tissues, extracellular matrix around senescent cells, um, and then um, reactive metabolites like bioactive uh, um, uh, bradykines, prostanoids, reactive, reactive uh, ROS, um, all kinds of other things. And then nucleotides um, like microRNAs that can uh, induce damage, as well as things like a, a mitochondrial DNA can be released um, related to cellular senescence. And it, this causes considerable damage to cells around uh, and activation of the immune system and spread of senescence. So senescent cells, as I mentioned before, are resistant to dying. I'll come back to that in a moment, but this is through what we call SCAPs, or senescent cell anti-apoptotic pathways. So senescent cells accumulate in multiple tissues with chronological aging. Um, this shows in kidney transplant donors, some of whom are quite elderly, if their grandmothers donating kidneys, for example, to their grandchildren. Uh, these people are fairly healthy compared to other individuals. They have to be in order to undergo a transplant donation surgery. And what we did was we looked at um, uh, senescent cells in adipose tissue and other tissues of these uh, donors. And there's an increase that occurs um, in different people somewhere between the 60s and 80s. It, oc it occurs fairly quickly and is almost exponential, at least in the case of adipose tissue. Senescent cells, as I mentioned, can occur at any point during life from conception on. Uh, indeed, uh, senescent cells accumulate in the placenta and produce factors that drive the baby through the birth canal. Uh, they're important during fetal development and other kinds of processes during development. But senescent cells will also accumulate at sites of multiple diseases, even in younger people. One of the uh, conditions that's associated with um, very uh, abundant senescent cell accumulation is obesity uh, in the context of diabetes. So on the uh, right, I show um, a slide from a younger woman who's obese and diabetic. Uh, you can see um, using SNES-associated beta-galactosidase staining, which is neither sensitive nor specific. There is no marker that's completely sensitive or specific, but at least it's semi-reasonable. You can see that the SNES cells tend to line blood vessels and some of them are outside. Uh, that's mainly because most of the senescent cells in adipose tissue are preadipocytes or mesenchymal stem cells or adipocyte-derived stem cells, whatever you want to call them, uh, as well as endothelial cells and uh, uh, parasites and other cells associated with blood vessels. The woman on the left, who's um, a little bit older but is non-diabetic and non-obese, uh, does not have the senescent cell accumulation. If you transplant very small numbers of senescent cells, you can cause dysfunction. So this shows transplanting senescent cells around the knee joint of a mouse on the right, compared to transplanting small numbers of senescent preadipocytes in this case that were made senescent by radiation. But uh, on the animal on the left had non-senescent cells uh, transplanted around the knee joint. And after a couple of months, the mice develop uh, who've had the senescent cells transplanted what looks very much like osteoarthritis in humans with joint space narrowing, subchondral osteoporosis, uh, and bony spicule formation. And mice do not get osteoarthritis unless you injure the, the joint, for example, uh, by surgery. They don't get spontaneous osteoarthritis the way that humans do or even hamsters do. But a very small number of senescent cells is sufficient to drive this state in mice. If you transplant a small number of radiation-induced or uh, not shown here, uh, chemotherapy-induced uh, senescent cells, in this case, preadipocytes or adipose-derived stem cells, whatever you want to call them, into the peritoneum of a middle-aged mouse, you cause the middle-aged mice that have the senescent as opposed to non-senescent cells transplanted into their peritoneum to become frail. Uh, they have decreased uh, speed on a, on, um, a treadmill, decreased hanging endurance, decreased grip strength, compared to animals that are transplanted with non-senescent cells. They also die earlier after a lag period. They die earlier of all diseases that uh, mice die from. Not any one disease, but almost every kind of disease that mice die naturally from, they die earlier from if you transplant 
small numbers of senescent cells. Now, the number, the number of senescent cells transplanted here is such that only one in 10,000 cells in the, in the recipient mouse is senescent. Very small numbers are sufficient to do this. Um, and if you transplant less than a million cells, though, into a middle-aged mouse, like 500,000, nothing happens. If you transplant, though, 500,000 senescent cells into a slightly older mouse, this uh, phenomenon of uh, frailty, earlier onset of age-related diseases, and early death occurs. Or if you take an obese mouse that's middle-aged as opposed to a lean mouse, you can make this happen if you transplant over only 500,000 as opposed to a million senescent cells. So this led us to propose what we call the threshold theory of senescent cells. That's that above a particular burden, uh, uh, senescent cells will induce uh, phenotypes. Below that, they tend not to. And part of the reason for this um, is that senescence spreads from cell to cell, not only in a paracrine, but also an endocrine fashion. So if we transplant senescent cells into the peritoneum of a middle-aged mouse, and those senescent cells are labeled with luciferase, so we can track them, and we can distinguish them from the recipient's own cells, we find that the uh, transplanted senescent cells remain within the peritoneum. But if we look in the limbs of the recipient mice, the recipient mouse's own formerly normal cells start becoming senescent. So senescence can spread in an endocrine manner, and that's partly related to the SAS factors I talked to you about before. Some of them are, some uh, uh, proteins can do this, but also there's a range of nucleotides and things like mitochondrial uh, DNA that can do this, as well as exosomes that senescent cells produce that can uh, cause senescence to spread. So again, back to this threshold theory, we feel that normally senescent cells are removed by the immune system. Uh, we feel that once uh, animals are above a particular threshold, the rate of spread of new senescent cells uh, exceeds the ability of the immune system to clear them. And then senescent cells themselves start poisoning the immune system. The IL-6 they produce impedes macrophage diapodesis. They produce um, uh, uh, MMPs that are proteases that cleave off things like fast ligand. Uh, they start uh, expressing don't eat me signals and they cause fibrosis, which impedes immune cell uh, clearance of senescent cells. So senescent cells start impairing the immune system once they're above a, above a threshold, leading to this takeoff that can occur. So um, I mentioned before that senescent cells were first reported in uh, 1961. Uh, it was found that senescent cells can accumulate with age and disease in human skin uh, in the um, um, uh, late 70s and early 80s. Um, we noted that if you take um, uh, rats that are double barrier uh, reared, cesarean born, fed the same food and water and given the same lighting throughout their lifespan, so the only thing that we hope that changes over time in these animals is their age, that senescent cells start accumulating in their adipose tissue. Um, Eugenia Wang noted in 1995 that senescent cells resist apoptosis. This was very important in our thinking. And then the key paper that drove us to uh, asking if, what happens if we clear senescent cells was a paper by Ned Sharpless, who's now director of the National Cancer Institute in Journal of Clinical Investigation in 2004. And what he found was that caloric restriction, which increases health span and lifespan, is, an, is associated with a delay in senescent cell accumulation. And that led us to ask, is this more than an association? Is there a causal link between cellular senescence and, um, uh, uh, and declines in health span and onset of age-related uh, dysfunction. So um, we, we noted, um, we'd noted before Ned Sharpless's paper came out that uh, preadipocytes with restricted replicative potential that were approaching senescence could produce TNF-alpha and that this goes up with age in adipose tissue. And then Judy Campisi published a paper in 2008 reporting the SASP. She'd been talking about it before that, but um, you know that uh, that was very important in our thinking. So we tried beginning in 2004 all kinds of approaches, including while we were still in Boston, to clear senescent cells. We worked with Jack Murphy to try to 
create fusion proteins that would bind to a senescent cell. And Carrier uh, talks at Cargo because he, he discovered some of the first uh, ways of making fusion proteins. We tried high throughput screens. We got nowhere. So then in May 2013, we resorted to a hypothesis driven approach to try to develop agents that would selectively kill senescent cells. And the two hypotheses we based our approach on were number one, senescent cells resist apoptotic stimuli. And this implied to us they must have pro survival anti apoptotic defenses because they have a SASP, they're producing TNF alpha, they're killing cells around them. Why do they survive? And then the second thing we used in developing these drugs is the observation that in many ways, senescent cells are like cancer cells that can't divide. You know, they have a Warburg, partial Warburg shift, that is they utilize um, glucose instead of fatty acids. They have a lot of changes in the way that their DNA is handled and other things that resemble what you see in cancer cells, especially the kinds of cancer cells that have apoptosis resistance, like B lymphomas and certain kinds of uh, leukemias. So what we then used was um, uh, based on proteomic uh, uh, data sets that we generated, we um, used uh, um, uh, programs uh, in conjunction with some very smart bioinformatics people, including people at University of Oklahoma. Uh, we used approaches to try to ask are there pro-survival networks that allow senescent cells to survive despite the fact they're killing the cells around them? So we're talking about the senescent cells that have a SASP, the 30 to 70% that have a SASP. We were wondering, do they have pro-survival networks that allow them to evade apoptosis? And we found there were. We found five of them to begin with. Now there are a total of nine of these SCAT pathways. They form a network. Uh, they uh, interact with each other. Uh, some of these uh, pathways are redundant and could theoretically compensate for each other if you knocked out only one of them. We the next used back in May 2013 uh, siRNA approaches to ask if we could knock down key nodes or combinations of nodes on these networks. Would we kill senescent cells but not normal cells? So we took radiation induced senescent cells, human cells. Um, in the one case, human preadipocytes or uh, uh, mesenchymal stem cells, uh, and on the other endothelial cells, human umbilical vein endothelial cells, and we made them senescent by radiation. And we added these siRNAs that were based on that map, that network pathway map that I showed you before. Uh, and we found that uh, indeed by knocking down certain nodes on the, these pathways, depending on the cell type, we could kill uh, senescent cells, depending on the cell type of origin. So we found in the case of mesenchymal progenitors like preadipocytes, that if we knock down pathways related to dependence receptors like the efferins, we could kill those senescent cells. And also if we knock down P21 related uh, elements, we could kill them and serpene related um, survival network elements. We found that knocking down BCL2 pathway family members would not kill senescent preadipocytes. We found that it was the 30 to 70% of cells that had a SASP that were killed. We didn't expect all of them to be killed, and we found indeed that 30 to 70% were killed, while non senescent preadipocytes were not killed. With Hubex, we found that um, targeting uh, the dependence receptors did not work. Uh, we found that P targeting P21 did not particularly work, but we found that targeting uh, BCL2 family members, particularly BCL extra large, did kill them. And we subsequently found with Paul Robbins that targeting HSP90 uh, net, uh, pathways, survival pathways, and others would kill senescent uh, endothelial cells. So the two cell types are killed, uh, are, depend on different components of the SCAP network for, the, for surviving, despite the fact they're killing cells around them. So then what we <clears throat> did was we used programs for the Broad Institute and our siRNA uh, data results and our, our uh, network results. And we looked for compounds using bioinformatics approaches that theoretically should kill senescent preadipocytes, human preadipocytes on the one hand, or senescent human endothelial cells on the other. We found about 30 hits. They all turned out to be senolytic. We haven't published all of them. But we initially focused on the compounds that were already in human use or that were natural products that we felt were safe. 
we also purposely focused initially on compounds that have a short elimination half-life. And I'll come back to that, um, the reason for that in a moment. We predicted that the satinib, which is a tyrosine kinase inhibitor, that unlike other tyrosine kinase inhibitors, hits SART kinase, which the dependence receptors like the efferins depend on. Uh, you know, um, and we predicted that imatinib, which is a general tyrosine kinase inhibitor, would not be senolytic because it doesn't target SART kinase the same way that dasatinib does. Dasatinib is a drug that's been around since 2006 for general medical use. Any physician can prescribe it. It's usually used for treating uh, lymphomas and leukemias. It's given daily. It's given for years at a time. Uh, uh, it's also used off-label for scleroderma and some other conditions. It's got an elimination half-life of between three and five hours in humans. Uh, we found it what killed senescent preadipocytes and left non-senescent preadipocytes alone. It killed the 30 to 70 percent that we that that have a SASP. We predicted it would not kill Huvex, and it didn't. Uh, and then the another drug we focused on early on is quercetin. It's in apple peels. It's a natural flavonoid, flavanol, so it makes apple peels taste bitter. Uh, it targets in part the BCL2 family, but also the HSP90 uh, network and some others that we predicted it would use to kill senescent Huvex. We predicted it would not kill senescent preadipocytes. It did not kill senescent preadipocytes. It did kill senescent Huvex. The combination killed um, uh, both senescent preadipocytes and Huvex. And Paul Robbins also found that there were some cell types that were sensitive, that were not, sen that would not, uh, some senescent cell types that would not be killed by dasatinib on its own or quercetin on its own, but were killed by the combination. Because in studies I didn't have time to show you, we found that a lot of times these pathways are redundant. So if you knock down just one pathway, uh, the other another uh, SCAT pathway can compensate and prevent the senescent cell from being killed. So that's the network I showed you before. This is what the combination of that drugs targets. And we did all of this in that one month in May 2013. Uh, and then since then, using that hypothesis-driven approach, some 30 or 40 other senolytics have been found. I've listed a few of them here. And then more recently, we worked with uh, Paul when he was uh, at Scripps, Florida, and developed a high throughput screen uh, for senescent cells. The trick of that screen is to have senescent and non-senescent cells in the same wells. And we found many, many more compounds with Paul since then. And we've been using, he's been using medicinal chemical approaches. He's now at University of Minnesota, working with Laura Niedernhofer. And using medicinal chemical approaches, we've got many, many more of these drugs now. And there are other ways of uh, targeting senescent cells that have come to light recently, immunomodulators, CAR-T approaches, vaccines, all kinds of other ways. So another agent we found is senolytic very early on is fizetin. It's one hydroxyl group different from quercetin. It's got a shorter elimination half-life. Unfortunately, for I don't have time to go into it, it cannot easily be mixed with the satinib. Uh, but on its own, it's very efficient in killing senescent um, endothelial cells. Uh, it's got uh, an elimination half-life in mice of a half hour and in humans of about four hours. Um, I mentioned to you also that we found that um, uh, some senescent cell types depend on BCL extra large for their survival. So uh, a drug that targets BCL extra large as well as BCL2 and BCLW is Nevitaclax. We found it was senescent uh, based on our studies a few, you know, 10 months earlier, we and another group published it within uh, 15 days of each other as being uh, another senolytic. It's sometimes called ABT263. So if we transplant um, light emitting senescent cells into mice and then treat with senolytic uh, drugs versus vehicle, we find that uh, 30 to 50% of the transplanted senescent cells, as we expect, because they're the cells that have assessed when the way these drugs work, is by allowing these cells to kill themselves that have a SASP. Um, we found 30 to 70% of the transplanted cells would be killed. Whereas if we transplanted non-senescent cells, they were not uh, affected by a pulse dose of these drugs. Uh, we found if we take human adipose tissue explants right from the operating room from obese diabetic individuals, I showed you before, they have a lot of, there are a lot of senescent cells there. We put them into organ culture. If we add senolytics for only two to three hours and remove them, uh, we find that senescent cells are dead by about 18 hours. 
So a brief exposure is sufficient to kill senescent cells through apoptosis, which uh, progresses. We use this method now, um, these explant methods, because we're able also to look at what's in the medium of the explants to uh, take drugs, drugs through uh, towards uh, clinical trials. So one of the better assays for uh, senescent cells, none of them are good, but the, the most sensitive and specific one known so far is called the TAF assay. And here we look at DNA damage foci within telomeric ends. And you can see that in these explants that I showed you before, if we have a brief exposure to a senolytic and then look um, uh, a day or so later, we find that we um, uh, remove um, uh, TAF expressing uh, cells, the senescent cells. The method of killing is by apoptosis, as shown by staining for cleaves caspase 3 here. And we also reduce SAS factors in the medium of these uh, adipose tissue explants while preserving things like adiponectin and adipsin and other uh, positive adipokine uh, levels. So in mice that have a single leg uh, radiated to induce senescence a couple of months before middle-aged mice, uh, they have trouble running on a treadmill. If we give a very few doses of these drugs early, you know, shortly after the radiation, like a month or two after the radiation, we find that uh, we're able to restore treadmill ability, running ability, and that persists throughout the remainder of the animal's life. Senescent cells don't divide. If there's no impetus for new senescent cells to form, new senescent cells don't form. In disease states where there's a continued impetus, like high fat feeding, and they're constantly forming, they take 10 days to six weeks to form, as I mentioned before. These drugs, you need a two hour to three hour exposure to kill senescent cells, and then it takes them a while to return. For that reason, we administer senolytic drugs in our clinical trials and in our animal studies in a hit and run manner. Depending on how quickly new senescent cells are forming, that can be once in a lifetime, for example, after radiation potentially, at least in mice, or it may be in the case of high fat feeding, for example, we have to administer these drugs once every two weeks uh, because there's a continued impetus for new senescent cells to form due to the high fat feeding. Sandeep Kosla found that um, if we clear uh, senescent cells with dasatinib and carcetin from aged mice uh, with age-related osteoporosis, that we restore not only cortical, but also trabecular bone mass. And this isn't just an arrest of progression, there's actual restoration. So in, in some bones, there's restoration of both cortical and trabecular, in others, it's just trabecular. And the mechanism is mainly because um, senescent cells interfere with stem cell function and progenitor cell dysfunction. As I mentioned to you before, this unitary theory holds that these fundamental aging processes are interlinked. And what Sundeep found with us was that senescent cells produce factors that cause osteoclasts to differentiate to, differ, to differentiate better and their progenitors to work better and osteoclasts resorb bone. And senescent cells also produce factors that inhibit osteoblast function. Osteoblasts are the cells that form new bone. So senolytics did the opposite and they result in both decreased bone resorption and some degree of increased bone formation. So uh, unlike current osteoporosis treatments uh, that are anti-resorptive, there's no uncoupling that occurs. There, there's, uh, you, you don't get this coupled response where you get decreased formation of new bone as well. With senolytics, we get decreased resorption and either unchanged or increased uh, new bone formation. And that's the basis for the clinical trial that's now underway. Sundeep also found that intermittent treatment with senolytics was as effective as continuous treatment. Um, in the case of obesity, if we um, look at uh, SA beta gal staining and we uh, treat intermittently mice with uh, desatinib and carcetin, we uh, improve uh, glucose tolerance. And when we do clamp studies, we find that this is because of decreased peripheral um, uh, insulin resistance. Others uh, at uh, Joslin, who we're now working with, found that uh, senolytics also kill senescent pancreatic uh, beta cells that can interfere with insulin production. Um, some kinds of senolytics will do that. Um, we find that um, senolytics do not directly target macrophages. There are many macrophages that have high P16 levels and also produce very similar SAS factors to senescent cells and also express SA beta gal. One of the problems with ink attack mice or P16 3MR mice is that you can kill 
those macrophages as well, confounding interpretation of some of those studies. We found senolytics do not kill activated macrophages, but they do kill uh, uh, P16 positive cells in adipose tissue that are truly senescent and not macrophages. But we do find uh, that there's decreased macrophage diapodesis. So if we take DBDB mice uh, and um, we inject labeled monocytes into their tail vein and follow them, as they, as they track to adipose tissue and become activated macrophages, you can see in the middle mouse in the image that the um, uh, monocytes injected into the tail vein go to their intra-abdominal adipose tissue. If despite animals having the same weight, same uh, diet and everything else, these animals are treated with senolytics um, uh, before uh, we inject um, the labeled monocytes into their tail vein, the monocytes no longer track to their adipose tissue. So what senescent cells do is they attract, activate, and anchor immune cells. Uh, we found in these DBD mice that we get less um, liver fat, steatosis, and cirrhosis. We find that we, uh, Jordan Miller found that um, APOE deficient mice that are high fat fed get less calcific atherosclerosis, something like lesions. Um, we find that we get improved um, uh, albumin to creatinine ratio and renal function in animals uh, that are obese diabetic um, or diet induced obese animals treated with uh, intermittently with senolytics. And we've, uh, uh, um, we found with Deanna Yurik here at Mayo that um, senescent fat like cells that accumulate in the uh, around the third ventricle in the appendema in the brain are targeted by senolytic drugs. So these cells look like fat cells. Um, they're actually senescent cells. They're in the, um, they're around the third ventricle. And it looks like um, when we clear them, we get improved neurogenesis around the third ventricle, decreased neuroinflammation and decreased anxiety. Anxiety is related to limbic system function, which is near the third ventricle. You can measure anxiety in mice by open field testing. Uh, obese mice are anxious. They won't venture into the open field. If we treat those obese mice despite continued uh, uh, um, high fat feeding, and these, these are DBDB animals, we don't change their diet. Um, we find that they're no longer, they're, they're, they have the same anxiety levels as uh, lean mice. Um, people we're now working with, but independently from us, Miranda Orr and Nick Muzi and others at San Antonio, and then uh, a group, Mark Matson and group at the NIH found in various models of Alzheimer's disease in mice, uh, beta amyloid and tau overexpressing animal models, that senolytics uh, reduce neuroinflammation, restore neurogenesis in the hippocampi and frontal areas, reduce and partially reverse a brain loss in the, um, in the prefrontal area and in the hippocampi and uh, result in a in a decreased expansion and actual partial reversal of the increase in ventricular size and result in improved uh, microvascular flow as well as improved memory and executive function in these mouse models. These mouse models are not perfect by any means, but they're the basis for the trials that are now underway in Alzheimer's disease of senolytics. Um, senolytics prevent and alleviate dysfunction caused by transplanting senescent cells into young mice, the model I showed you before, so you reverse those effects. Uh, in old mice, um, you find that uh, physical function is improved in 20-month-old um, mice given uh, these drugs once every two weeks for four months. We get improvement in uh, rotor rod performance in hanging endurance, grip strength, uh, uh, maximal speed on treadmill, uh, daily activity, etc. Uh, we find a slight increase in median lifespan, not much of an effect on maximum lifespan. Uh, the increase in median lifespan is associated with a delay in all uh, age-related diseases, the converse of what we see when we transplant senescent cells, sort of fulfilling cost postulates. So there's emerging evidence for benefits of senolytics on some 40 or 50 conditions now, uh, various senolytics uh, that multiple groups are finding. Um, and you'd expect that if the jar of science hypothesis is true. So if fundamental aging processes are root cause contributors to a range of conditions, you would expect this to be true. So we're not dealing here with a one drug, one target, uh, one disease paradigm. We're dealing with agents that uh, may be combinations of agents that hit multiple targets on the SCAP network 
and that where, where we can go after multiple conditions that may be age-related. So it's very different from the usual drug development paradigm. So there are a number of clinical trials underway. There are 15 of them uh, here at Mayo and there are others going on. Uh, I don't have time to go into all of them. Uh, we don't have many results yet. Um, we formed something called the Translational Geroscience Network through the NIH. So it's a, uh, a consortium of the universities shown. Um, uh, and what we're doing is trials, not just of senolytics, but of other drugs that target fundamental aging mechanisms like NAD precursors, uh, CD38 inhibitors, metformin, rapamycin, various sirtuin agonists, et cetera, uh, as well as uh, senolytics ac across all these sites. So we're doing multi-center, small proof of concept trials for individuals with serious age-related conditions for which there's no good treatment because we don't know the downsides of these drugs yet, we could cause severe harm. So um, we're, we, we're testing across, uh, using similar protocols across disease states that we know are, in the case of senolytics, are associated with cellular senescence and where, we're, uh, where the risk-benefit ratio uh, justifies this, because we're playing with fire. We're playing with a fundamentally uh, process, a cell fate, and we don't know what all the adverse effects could be. We published a very small, um, this is the corrigendum, which is what you should look at rather than the main paper, uh, trial in people with obesity and diabetes. We um, um, biopsied their adipose tissue and took their blood at day zero. We gave three days of the satin of incarcetin. Remember, we give these drugs intermittently. Uh, 11 days after the last dose at day 14, and these drugs are cleared by day four if the last dose is at day three. We re-biopsied them, looked at their um, uh, uh, blood as well. So in this way, we're using a hit and run approach. We're um, avoiding constantly targeting a receptor or an enzyme or something like that. We're not looking for steady state drug levels. We're giving a brief dose, trying to get a peak, and then, and then uh, not repeating the drug. And we found that P16 positive SA beta gal positive cells in their adipose tissue and these obese diabetic subjects were reduced. Uh, CD38, 60, uh, CD68 positive M1 uh, macrophages were reduced, crown-like structures or fibrosis was reduced, and a panel of uh, SAFS markers that David Allison at University of Indiana worked with us on developing uh, was reduced so that we can follow. We've, we've now got what we call facility for gyroscience analysis. So we're measuring 72 different things across our clinical trials in blood. Uh, as well as things like epigenetic clocks across these trials. But this seemed to be the panel in this particular kind of uh, patient population that, where we could see responses. We did another very early phase trial in idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. This was open label. There are learning effects and all kinds of reasons this may not be um, correct, but it gave us enough ammunition to start uh, a, a double-blind placebo-controlled trial in idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, which is beginning at three sites. So this initial trial we found, and you have to take it with a grain of salt, um, improvement in six minute walk, um, gait speed, um, uh, chair stands, and uh, short physical performance battery. And this was based on studies done by Nathan Labrasser, my colleague here, um, uh, looking at bleomycin-induced pulmonary fibrosis and effects of these drugs in that mouse model of idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis where there were benefits. So we took that through to an early phase clinical trial. It was very short duration, just nine doses over three weeks. We weren't looking for changes in pulmonary fibrosis because we knew that um, frailty would be the first thing that should improve. So we weren't looking for long-term signals in this. We were just asking, is it worth doing uh, a double-blind placebo-controlled trial? There, there are trials underway with Alzheimer's disease, which I won't go through. Uh, one of the trials is um, a case control study um, looking at target engagement. That one's just begun. There's another one called STOMP AD, which is a double-blind placebo-controlled trial that's going to be three sites in Alzheimer's disease looking at memory and executive function. The Alton trial is funded by the Alzheimer's Association. The STOMP AD trial is founded, funded by the Alzheimer's Drug Discovery uh, Fund. There's uh, several NIH trials underway, supported trials. One of them is by Sundeep Kossel. It's halfway through now looking at senolytics for age-related osteoporosis, as I mentioned uh, before. Uh, in this particular trial, dasatinib and carcetin are being compared to fizetin. So dasatinib and carcetin and fizetin are the two drugs we're taking to the first uh, clinical trials. Uh, 
we had to get an IND for Fazetin um, uh, and register it as a drug. It had never been registered as a drug before. We had to write a 415 page long proposal, do two years of studies, go through monkeys and all kinds of things, but now we're allowed to use that drug. Um, we found that senescence is increased in childhood cancer survivors who have frailty. And this is the basis of the St. Jude trial, um, looking at childhood cancer survivors. So these people who've had alkaline agents or anthracyclines plus radiation as children are getting an accelerated aging like syndrome in their 30s or 40s, at least some of them. Uh, Carrie Ness and Greg Armstrong at St. Jude have over 800 of these patients they're following. They look like they're 70, they're frail, they have diabetes, many of them get Alzheimer's disease at the ages of 35 or 40. Um, uh, Kerry did studies in um, looking at senescent cell burden in these individuals and it was increased uh, and correlated with uh, walk speed ability. So a trial was started at St. Jude, uh, again, an NIH funded trial uh, comparing Desatinib and Kersetin to Fazetin in these um, individuals and uh, looking at um, uh, freed uh, criteria. Um, we found with Stefan Tullius at Harvard that transplanting, if you transplant hearts from old to young animals, as you'd guess from the transplant studies I showed you before, you cause problems in the young animals that you don't cause if you transplant a heart from a young to a young animal. Uh, transplant surgeons know this. This is part of the reason they throw away kidneys from uh, donors who are over age 50 who die in car accidents, for example. Uh, and uh, Stefan has also found, and there, there are data indicating that uh, uh, organs transplanted into humans from older donors don't do very well and induce more rejection, the same as he found in the mice. We found that by transplanting, by, by treating the donor, the organ itself, or the recipient with senolytics, we could prevent that. Uh, so we have a trial underway now um, with Stefan looking at uh, kidneys from older donors and another trial just beginning in Holland looking at livers from older donors to see if we can rehabilitate them while they're on perfusion. Uh, so this, this just shows that one of the main mechanisms that older organs cause problems is because of this mitochondrial DNA that they produce that activates lymph nodes and spreads senescence. Um, and these are the trials that I just mentioned. Uh, there are trials underway now with uh, coronavirus. Uh, we found that um, uh, uh, coronavirus antigens cause cells to become senescent and exacerbate the senescence-associated secretory phenotype of existing senescent cells. Many of the risk factors for coronavirus are the same as uh, the risk factors for accumulating senescent cells. And we found with Paul Robbins and Laura Niedernhofer in a paper that's under review at the moment that old mice infected with a beta coronavirus, something like human coronavirus, die where young mice don't. And if we treat them with senolytics, we uh, reduce their uh, mortality and we reduce it through both decreasing cytokine storm and increasing immune responses to the most beta coronavirus. So in conclusion, the target of senolytics is senescent cells. It's not a single molecular pathway. Targeting networks yields more truly senolytic and less panolytic treatments than going after a single target. Um, we found, uh, and I didn't have time to go into it, but, and other groups like Gina Ellison in London, for example, with cardiac uh, progenitors, and I showed you Sundeep's data, um, and there, there are many other systems that we find that senolytics alleviate age-related progenitor dysfunction. Uh, we find that we get attenuation in age-related changes and disease-related changes in tissue inflammation. Uh, intermittent treatment looks to be as or more effective than uh, continuous treatment. This way we can avoid off-target effects and side effects, hopefully. So it looks like senolytics delay or alleviate multiple chronic diseases and enhance cell span and perhaps median lifespan in mice, but we don't know in humans. Uh, there are people beginning to take these drugs. Uh, we strongly recommend against that. Physicians should absolutely not be prescribing these drugs. The only place for these drugs at the moment is in carefully controlled clinical trials. We don't know what the downsides are going to be and they could be terrible and we don't know for sure if they work in humans. So I, I'd really caution anybody against even thinking about using these drugs outside the context of a clinical trial. So I'll conclude by thanking a huge number of people who worked on this. Tamara Chaconia has been uh, working with me on this for 30, 30 plus years since we were at Boston University. Um, Izu uh, with Tamara and myself, um, came up with this way of making um, senolytics back in May 2013. 
And then there are many collaborators uh, at Mayo, um, many in the Boston area and uh, around the country and around the world who are helping us out as well as many uh, funding agencies. So thank you very much. Okay, th thank you so much, Dr. Kirkland, for an excellent presentation. Um, if people have time, there is a little bit of time for some questions. One that came in while you were speaking was just to ask whether you could distinguish between the use of senolytics in post-mitotic cell environments versus tissues where cell, pro pro cell proliferation continues. Um, well, what we find is that um, there may, there's a lot of debate about this and we're working on it. There may be some post-mitotic cells that, uh, uh, that, that have a senescent-like state. Uh, but we find generally that it's, uh, if we clear senescent cells, um, post-mitotic cells do a lot better. I mean, across all the conditions that, that we've looked at, because senescent cells are producing factors that, inter you know, like inflammatory mediators and things that impair function of post-mitotic cells. Some of the best work relating to post-mitotic cell work has been done by Gina Ellison in, at King's College in London. So uh, people could refer to her papers about that. Thank you. Uh, there's a question coming in about patients with genetic disorders of accelerated aging, like progeria. Do they have more senescent cells, and do D and Q have beneficial effects for those patients? Well, we've we've tested these drugs on a range of prodroid uh, animal models, including Laura Niedernhofer's ERCC uh, minus delta mice that have a, you know, and they they work in those contexts. Laura is very active with the, the foundation uh, that's involved with the people with that particular progeria. So I think there's movement in that direction towards discussion, at least about trials. Uh, the other conditions like Hutchinson, Guilford and so forth are associated with senescent cell accumulation. We don't know though, and I haven't personally done work in that area, but there, there are several prodroid syndromes where they um, uh, appear in mouse models to have some benefit, but clinical trials haven't um, uh, started. The accelerated aging condition that we've looked at the most is these childhood cancer survivors. Okay. Um, the other one that we're looking at is people who've had bone marrow transplantation. Uh, these people with Shrew Kashmi, and that trial is nearly finished. So these people have lethal doses of radiation and chemotherapy before they're transplanted. Um, and what Shrew found. Um, is that um, the patients who don't die of graft versus host disease or return of their cancer, some of them at three to five years are developing an accelerated aging-like state with diabetes, dementia, and frailty. So we've actually got a trial under, uh, that clinical trial is actually underway and ne nearly finished. I, I guess, Jim, if you think about this, do you think you have to just do sort of the one hit with the senolytics or, or, or is there a, is there a time interval where it has to be repeated like every you know, year or six months or? I think it depends on the condition and we found that in mice. So uh, mm -hmm. one of, uh, we've, we've got a PhD student who's just doing her, finishing her thesis on that. She's got her defense in a couple of uh, months. Okay, and yeah. um, so in conditions where there's an acute uh, induction of uh, senescence, say with radiation, um, a very few doses after the radiation are sufficient, um, you know, uh, to have effects for many, many months in those mice. Whereas conditions where there's continued impetus to generation of senescent cells, say in the pro prodroid syndromes you talked about, or um, in high fat feeding or other contexts where there's a continued imp impetus, we'd suspect that repeated administration may be necessary, but we don't know completely. We don't know yet completely. One final question, and I think then we'll have to go, but are there any ongoing clinical trials to study if senolytics enhance chemotherapy efficacy in cancer patients? Yeah, those are being active. And the NCI uh, has a paper coming out about that. They had, um, uh, they had a think tank conference that papers in review, I mean, it was reviewed and is being uh, you know, revised. So the NCI has a position paper on that. And I think um, it wouldn't be surprising if there isn't an RFA coming out from that. So Dr. Pastana at the NIA, at the NCI is the lead author on that paper that's coming.
Great. Well, well, on behalf of our Healthy Aging Priority Area Research Group at Tufts, uh, Dr. Kirkland, I just want to really thank you for your outstanding presentation, spending some time with us today. So for, for, those, for everyone on the line, this concludes our seminar uh, for today. And uh, we have an upcoming seminar in a couple of weeks with Dr. Torn Finkel from the University of Pittsburgh. But, but thank you all for joining. Um, and I think Andrew is going to share the screen, but th that's okay. Great. Okay. So, so thank you very much, uh, Jim, and uh, glad you could join us today. Thanks, Roger. Great talking to you again. Sometime I hope to see you in person. Yeah. Next uh, we've time got we'll, a, we've we'll, got a boat on Cape Cod and Canada. Yeah. There, you know. I, I hope it's surviving over the last year, but I'm, I'm sure it's okay. But yes, yeah. it'll be wonderful. Okay. Thank bye -bye. you so much. Bye bye, Jim. Thanks. Thank you, everyone.